Recently, I had two exchanges with family members that did not go particularly well. Both were spurred on by trying to refute or debate claims fueled by divisive media outlets. Since the election, I have myself largely tuned out of political shows, but like Michael Corleone says in The Godfather, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. I called one of them the following day and posed this simple question. Does watching political shows bring you any joy? The answer to which was a quick no. I replied with, does it bring you any happiness? Again, a quick no. And finally I asked, then why do you spend so much time each week watching it? It's a question we could ask ourselves about various parts of our lives. When confronted with a problem, our natural solution tendency is to add something. If we're feeling disorganized, we go to the container store to buy some sought after organizing product. If we're not feeling productive, we add a productivity app to our phone. Don't like the clothes in our closets? We buy new ones. If we're frustrated with our politics, we watch shows that make us more frustrated. This plays out not just individually, but societally. We start new organizations to address old problems, we draft new legislation or regulation to solve ongoing social issues, and so on. In short, in private and public, we have what Lydie Klotz calls an addition bias. His new book, Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less, makes a compelling case that we often leave an important tool for change in the toolbox. Bringing more subtraction into your life means improving productivity by focusing on fewer things on your to-do list, or getting rid of clothes you don't like in your closet so you can see the ones you do more easily. It's looking to remove policies that do harm before adding more to contend with, and it is reducing the time we spend doing things that make us frustrated or angry. We can all feel at times like we're weighed down. The load we are carrying is simply too much. The responsibilities, the activities, the cognitive load of trying to manage it all can be overwhelming. We feel this weight in our shoulders and in our psyche. The weight keeps us from rising up to enjoy what life has to offer. Often we are the beasts that create our own burdens. I'm not trying to be glib or suggest we should just subtract the things we don't like in our lives. Responsibilities are real. We all have things we just need to do for ourselves or for our families. What I am suggesting is that our natural tendency to add means we often leave a simpler solution to subtract on the sidelines. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with Lydie Klotz, a professor at the University of Virginia who studies how we transform things from how they are to how we want them to be. He's written for the Washington Post, Fast Company, The Globe and Mail, and The Behavioral Scientist. His latest book is Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. It is a wonderful and relatable read, so relevant to our everyday lives. I hope you enjoy. Lydie, I wanted to start with a, a quick sort of a story about how I even stumbled upon your book. So I was, I was on vacation. I'm in a wonderful bookstore in Bozeman, Montana. And I'm just, uh, you know, trying to find something. And I stumble upon your book. The cover grabs me. And I was like, I'm not sure. And then I turned it over and I saw that Scent Hill had given you a nice blurb and who I, who I know and respect. And so I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll check it out. I'm really, really glad I did. Uh, cause it's a great book. But the funny thing was that after I started to read it, I wanted to learn more about you. And so I Google and I see this, uh, the first thing that comes up is professional soccer player. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's such a, it's a, a unique name. Um, it's odd that there'd be these two people <laughs> who, um, you know, one's a soccer player and one's written this book and is an academic and only to discover it was the same person. So I'm just curious, like, how do you go from a professional soccer player to a person who studies engineering and then behavioral science and then and then writes this book? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I kind of split my life in two parts, uh, but obviously there's common strands across them. But I mean, soccer was my whole focus growing up. You know, I, of course, loved the, the sport and the game, but it was also like this was the area that I could really focus on and try to see how, how good can I be at this? Um, and you could see that like inputs like practice and, and things like that would be directly reflected in a game. Getting to professional soccer uh, was like a lot of time, a lot of fun, a lot of great coaches, a lot of those things. And uh, fortunately, I had family and you know, I think I knew myself too, that this wasn't going to be the 
the be all end all. I was going to have to do something after I was done playing soccer. I mean, when I played professional soccer, I was making $2,000 a month. <laughs> so I knew I would have to do something else. So fortunately, I, I went to college to play soccer um, and was able to play soccer while getting my undergraduate engineering degree. But it wasn't really until after I was done playing soccer, so like two years after undergraduate where I started thinking about, okay, now I have to do a job where I spend a lot of time at this thing. And, you know, hopefully it's something where I can actually make a positive contribution to the world. Um, and that's when I started thinking about the engineering, engineering for sustainability, um, whether I wanted to do that in practice or be a professor. And so it was like kind of two separate parts of my life. I mean, up until I was 22, I guess it would be, it was, you know, I was just solely focused on soccer. And then after that, it, it kind of shifted. It must have been a unique thrill then when you were somehow to uh, to bridge those two interests and passions with your first book, right? Which yeah. again, I didn't put it together, but I had been separately in a bookstore a while ago. And I think I mentioned in our email exchange, like I, I coached my three daughter soccer teams, right? Yeah. But I was not a player myself. So it's been sort of a, a huge learning curve over the years. But but I saw this book about soccer and sustainability, and I was you like, "Oh, that one!" Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was just like, "I was like, wow!" I mean, it was intriguing. I did not pick it up. I have to be honest with you. But I imagine that when you sort of put those two concepts together, it must have been a really wonderful experience to marry two two loves, right? So the idea was to make sustainability more accessible by like describing it through soccer. But I think what it did was uh, make it only interesting to people who are interested in sustainability and in soccer <laughs> so like kind of had the opposite effect because um, I, I had a lot of comments where you know like my sustainability friends would read it it's like I, don't, I know nothing about soccer and of course the stories are meant to be you don't need to know anything about soccer to enjoy the book yeah so it was a lot of fun and you're exactly right that it was a amazing opportunity to be able to like kind of marry those two things together and fun to do that kind of self-reflection I do like soccer and I do like sustainability. So I, I guess I was in that sort of small audience. Two things that sort of struck me. One was the, I know in my work, there's a lot of discussion around systems and it just, it's not accessible. I mean, people don't really sort of understand it. So the use of the soccer metaphor, I thought was brilliant. There was uh, something I was reading in an article about the book about um, penalty kicks. Mm. You were using it as a lesson on inertia, I think. And it was the classic sort of like 1972 yeah. or 76 German example of instead of like <laughs> yeah. sort of trying to drill it to the corner, someone just sort of like pops it like softly yeah, the through Kanenka. the middle. <laughs> and so yeah. It was Czech, actually. And so I don't I mean, this penalty kick is becoming more popular thanks to YouTube. But I went through my whole soccer career not knowing about it. And so basically what you do on the penalty kick is a penalty kick in soccer. You're 12 yards away from the goal, the shooter and the goalie, and they have, I don't know, it's it, above a 75% chance of scoring. And what happens is the goalie can move on the line before the person shoots. And so if the goalie doesn't move and you're going against a good shooter, the, the goalie has no chance because a good shooter just shoots it in the corner. So the goalie tries to, to guess and, um, and move early and try to guess one side or the other. And so this leads to this cat and mouse game. And then this Panenka guy who is a player for the Czech Republic back in the 70s, he's like, well, if the goalies are going to guess, if you shoot to one side or the other, you're always susceptible to potentially shooting where the goalie guessed. But if I shoot it right down the middle and the goalie's <laughs> definitely guessing, I'm, I'm safe. And not only did he shoot it down the middle, but he had to shoot it kind of soft because he wanted the goalie's momentum to take them out of the way of where your shot was going. So you want to give them enough time. And so this is incredibly like risky, but also not risky thing to do. I mean, you risk looking like a fool if you shoot it really soft and the goalie doesn't move and they just stand there and catch it, which, you know, there's some good YouTube videos of that happening. But Panenka was the first one to figure this out and he practiced it a ton in practice and then used it in the European Championship, which like second after the World Cup, there's no other bigger tournament in the Czech Republic, you know, got to the final of the European Championship, huge deal for them. And they're playing the uh, West Germany, I guess it was at the time, get to penalty shootout, Panenka comes up with the opportunity to like, he makes it, they win the European Championship. And he does a Panenka. You can go watch it on YouTube I did. too. I, I, yeah. I watched it. The thing that was hilarious too, is the guy who goes before him, 
does the classic try to drill it in the corner and he goes high and to the right, right? Uh-huh. And so that's the, the, the risk there. I will say for anyone who's listening who's a youth soccer coach, this is not probably a good strategy to deploy <laughs> because no. the, the kids naturally just sort of hit it at the goalie as is and the goalie is not necessarily sort of like trying to, uh, to jump. Yeah. I, I wanted to sort of uh, segue into an, another game, I guess, that is, is uh, related to your, your new book, Subtract. So which is Legos, right? Mm-hmm. And so as I record this, we've got bins of Legos overflowing sort of in our home. And so very familiar with sort of the joys that come in building things. But it was interesting to me that I think even your book opens with a story and then it has another story about Legos later. But I'm wondering if you could briefly describe the Lego experiment as an introduction into the idea of, of subtract. Well, the first thing that happened with the Legos was playing with my son who was three at the time. And so it was actually the Duplo blocks. And we were trying to make this Lego bridge. It wasn't level. And so I turned around behind me to grab a block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned back around, he had removed a block from the longer column. (laughs) And I mean, I'm a engineer designer. I'd always been interested in these kind of like minimalist designs. But what that action showed me in that moment was like, okay, Ezra just, my son, just subtracted a block away. And that's the thing that I'm actually interested in is this, this specific act, not necessarily the, the end state. And then even better, foreshadowing what we would end up finding in the experimental research we did. What happened to me in that moment is actually really close to how we think about subtraction in general, or like why we overlook subtraction more generally is that we are presented with something that we want to change or we want to make better. In this case, it was, we want to make this level bridge, but it also applies when we want to improve our calendars or improve the thoughts that are in our heads. We're presented with this situation and our first instinct is to think, Oh, what can I add to make it better? And that's what I did. I was going to add a block and make it better. And if Ezra hadn't been there to think of subtracting, I would have just added, moved on, and never even considered whether subtracting could be better or not. And again, you know, this Lego example is just the first example in our thinking. We went on and did experiments. We had experiments, some of them with Legos, where subtracting was obviously the better answer. If you subtracted, you only had to remove one block. If you added, you had to add eight blocks, and it cost money to add blocks. Um, And people would still overlook the subtractive option. And so again, what it's showing is that we systematically overlook this as a way to to make things better i don't remember if this is in the book and i don't know if you have an answer so maybe just a hypothesis but your son who was young instinctively subtracted i have a i know where you're going (laughs) the only bad thing about that example i mean it's a true example so it's like but it's it's so powerful Oh, and it, it starts you thinking like, oh, maybe kids are better at this. We, we haven't studied it on kids. Um, we actually do have plans to do that. But there's no, we don't have any evidence that suggests kids are better. And I would say that my evidence from playing with Ezra is that this was just like one of the random times that he stumbled across <laughs> subtraction because he adds. I think he's even worse at adding than, than I am. But yeah, there, I mean, there is a legitimate, it is worth testing because I think one of the theories would be, is there kind of a, well, if, if the reason that we're doing this is because it's taught to us, right. Or if it's something we learned throughout our, our schooling, then you would think that maybe three-year-olds would be less likely to do it. I think it's unlikely that that would be the, the sole cause of it. The, the schooling, again, we don't have any evidence that kids are better at it than grownups. Where I was going was similar, but it was oh, less about. Sorry, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. You were, you were, you were in the, <laughs> you were in the right ballpark. It was this, you know, you talk about uh, an addition bias, right? That mm-hmm. we are just biased towards sort of looking to add to solve a problem, and we overlook subtraction as a, as a potential option. What I was wondering is that a natural thing, you know, or is it something other influences, whether it's schooling or I was thinking more broadly, like culturally, yeah, um, especially in the United States. You know, are certain cultures more likely to to think that more is more, you know, mm-hmm. versus stopping and pausing the research to try to get to this on a quantitative level would probably be really sort of difficult. Right. But I'm just wondering if you have any sort of theories or if you've seen anything that might give some insight in towards of where this bias even comes from. As with any behavior, there's going to be multiple kind of reasons for it, right? Or, and I think, you know, first you would look at our biology. So what has happened 
that has helped us pass down our genes throughout the, these generations that might like make us more likely to add or, or subtract. And if you think about acquiring food, uh, the other, another biological one is displaying competence. So just showing mm -hmm. that we can effectively interact with the world is a real fundamental biological need. I mean, animals build, bowerbirds build ceremonial nests to display competence. Um, and so to the extent that it's easier to show competence by adding Legos than it is by taking them away, you know, there's, there's some real kind of solid biological reasons why we could be doing this. Um, and then you think about cultural forces, right? So um, these things that have helped cultures move forward. The most direct evidence we had, we, we did study people in Germany and people in Japan uh, and didn't, there was more variation within the, within the groups of people than there was across the groups of people. So we didn't find any like direct evidence that these cultures were different. I think it wasn't the point of our study to test across cultures. But one thing, if you look at the history of all cultures and you can go back to like, okay, when was civilization coming about? If you look at what was there when we went from basically being hunter gatherers to like living in in cities, you know, people agree that there was a kind of organized religion, writing, you know, cities, people coming in together closely, but also there was this thing called monumental architecture, which is basically like people building stuff that had no purpose other than to kind of inspire awe in each other. And so in this one way of adding, which is like adding in the physical environment to, to create this monumental architecture, I mean, that's been there since the beginning of our, our civilization. The direction that's going in kind of the people who study this deep history of human civilization is that uh, that this monumental architecture was was not only there at the beginning, but it was also like really instrumental in helping helping create civilizations. And the theory being that you know to come together, you've got roaming bands of hunter gatherers. You know you're pretty limited in what you can make. You know you, you're whatever these twenty five people can do. That's that's what you can make. Um, and plus you have to roam to follow the food. But if you want to make something big, you've got to coordinate with other bands. Um, you've got to figure out a way to stay in the same spot. The theory is that this um, this desire to build large things is what had people come together in the first place. So again, that's that's one type of adding, um, but it's a uh, it's adding that was kind of instrumental to the, the founding of our civilization. And then if you look at how from when civilization started until basically till where we are now, I mean, adding is often the better way to make things better, right? If you don't have a city, if you don't have a road, if you don't have a, a language, if you don't have a book, you need to add them. And, and adding is a better way to kind of improve the information or improve the the physical environment. And, but having added for 10,000 years, we're, <laughs> we're there, there's, there's more opportunities to take things away to make them better. So there's, there's a, you know, in addition to the biological reasons, there's also cultural reasons why like over time adding has been good for our societies. And this is, you know, the same way biological evolution kind of reinforces itself. This kind of cultural evolution can reinforce itself and the, the cultures that add, you know, evolve to, become us. You know, one of the reasons why I was asking about the question of culture is I'm really fascinated about this sort of bias to add, yeah. you know, and the neglect of subtract in the context of how we go about our daily lives in pursuit of a better life, or as some people might say the American dream, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which, which I think certainly has an addition bias in full, full view. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, your work in the context in terms of with how people go about their daily lives with this sort of, again, maybe it is for, for reasons of competency or displaying, and maybe it's because sometimes it is really good to get something new or to add something, but there does seem to, to be a full-throated embrace of addition and more as a key definer of, of success or, or happiness. Exactly right. I think that the more equals better. I mean, that's the, I think that's the title of chapter four. And what, what's interesting is that that hasn't always been the case. Um, it's, you know, really kind of taken off post-World War II in terms of, you know, tied in with 
gross domestic product and this economic growth. And a lot of this has been really amazing for society at large, but it, the problem becomes when we think that more equals better in every case, right? It's like, oh, if I do more activities, if I'm busier, that's like a, a badge of honor, which, you know, that's totally what happens, right? You go talk to somebody about how their life's going and it's like, oh, I'm so busy. And it's kind of this humble brag. Um, and why is it, why aren't we impressed with the person who's saying, oh, I got nothing to do. I was just like, <laughs> late, I was hanging out all afternoon. I went to play golf. I, you know, I went to the market. I got to hang out with my in-laws or whatever. Um, but no, we're impressed with the person or we, we feel like it's good to be able to say I'm doing all this, all this stuff. So that certainly is the case. I mean, I, you don't need me to tell people that and you just look around and see it. I think one of the things, and this ties into Sendel's work that you mentioned before um, on scarcity and cognitive load, but you know, one of the things that we found in our research was that when people were under cognitive load, so cognitive load being, you know, we tested this in our research by having numbers scroll across a computer screen. And every time a five went by, somebody had to press an F on their keyboard while they're also solving these tasks, testing how well they can subtract. So what that simulates is like, okay, you're thinking about multiple things. And when people are busy or thinking about multiple things, they default even more to this tendency to add. And that's that's really important. Mm. And it's like creates this reinforcing cycle, right? So it's like you're busy. The reason you're busy is because you've added. The one thing that could relieve this busyness is, is taking some things away. But because you're busy, you're even less likely to take things away, you're, you're more likely to think, okay, I'm going to solve this busyness problem by adding some more stuff onto it. It creates this like really harmful reinforcing cycle, I think. And um, again, the, the good thing is it's not impossible to, to think of subtracting, right? It's, you know, it's, but it, it is left to our own devices. We tend not to, it seems like. So you mentioned the, uh, you know, I guess the opposite of a virtuous circle, you know, the sort yeah. of the solution to having too much is to try to get something else that can make that problem, you know, easier, right? Mm -hmm. I see this in my own life, which is strange is that often if you looked at the list of things, right, you know, in one category or another, you might even say like, you know, here are all the demands on my time. I actually like all of these things. Yeah. And yet cumulatively, you're not able to enjoy them as much because there's just too much and then it's like okay well maybe the solution is like a different app you know to sort of like <laughs> right. make this easier for myself yeah you know which is a, a, a sort of a crazy solution but you know so there's the there's the cognitive load issue that you just mentioned but i imagine there's also just other barriers um i think in your book you write around about loss aversion and other reasons why you know even contemplating subtraction is not intuitive or maybe um, we resist it. You're exactly right that that a lot of the cases we're talking about here are cases where the stuff is good, but the subtraction would make it even better. One of the studies that really sticks out that we did, we, we gave people this travel itinerary to Washington, D.C., and it was like 12 or 14 different activities over the course. I think it was 12 activities over 14 hours. And the in a day trip to Washington, DC. And these were big activities. It's like visit the Washington Monument, tour the, you know, go to the Smithsonian Museum. And we presented it to people on like a drag and drop interface. So they're staring at this 14 hour day with 12 different activities in Washington, DC. There's like three hours of just travel time if you mm -hmm. put it on Google Maps. And people still try to improve that by by adding. So I mean, in that case, there's like a little <laughs> bit of a, a fear of missing out. And it's it's like this case that you said, Bob, where it's these are all good things. Of course, it's fun to go to the Washington Monument. Of course, you want to see the Vietnam Veterans Memorial if you're in Washington, DC. Overall, your day is going to be horrible if you try to do all of them. Relieving that by taking away isn't an e isn't an easy thing to do. And then you mentioned loss aversion too. And so, I mean, loss aversion, really well-known, widespread psychological phenomenon from Kahneman and Tversky's work where we're, you know, basically twice as likely to, or twice as disappointed to lose something as we are to gain something of the same value, you know, so that, that plays in here too. If we think that, you know, taking away is going to be a loss, it's twice as painful uh, that that taking away. But one reason what we're talking about here is different is that 
in this case, taking away is not a loss. You know, Kahneman and Tversky are talking about like real losses, like you lost $50 or you lost this beneficial thing. We're, we're talking about taking away to make things better. We should be able to kind of get around to that loss aversion. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station WNET in New York, reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. And now back to our conversation. You can glean from this interview and one thing you'd sort of take away is, oh, this is just about sort of like personal stuff, right? So you need to, you know, have fewer things on your to-do list or don't drive yourself crazy and stuff like that, which in our personal lives, the power and the ability to subtract, you know, is huge. But what's also interesting about your work and in the book is that you're also giving examples from whether it's in the Embarcadero or whether it's uh, apartheid, like things that have uh, that solutions that are based in subtraction have the ability to affect millions of lives or hundreds of thousands of lives. And yet as policymakers or designers or people with you know certain influence, we're not really we're not, we're we're leaving that tool in the box. Yeah, that's an awesome way to say it. We're leaving that tool in the box. And they are these big social issues that we think about, like climate change, systemic inequality, um, city planning. And one of the things I try to do in the book too, is show that, you know, yeah, these are big systemic issues, but there's also you know, as individuals, we can have an impact on them. So the story of the Embarcadero in San Francisco, this is a freeway that came down that was blocking their Eastern waterfront. And so if you visit San Francisco today, this is like one of the most visited tourist destinations in the world. And until 1990, basically, it was blocked by a a double decker highway. And there was a city planner in it, or not even a, she wasn't trained as a city planner, but this woman named Sue Bierman, who was really active in the community and, you know, got involved in city planning in San Francisco and was instrumental in kind of helping the city remove this highway and seeing that that was something, a way to, to make the city better. And it's, it's interesting. If you look at the infrastructure plans that are kind of going through, um, or being debated now, um, highway removal is a a much bigger topic of conversation. So, you know, not only did the people who were able to remove that highway to make San Francisco better change San Francisco, but they've also like kind of provided this example that other cities are, are latching onto. And then, you know, the policy one, that's, if I'm remembering correctly, basically the growth of federal regulations in the United States, like since 1950, there's like 17 times more federal regulations than there were in 1950. And so, you know, there's just tons of evidence that, yeah, our go-to solution is to to add, to try to make policies better. And of course, sometimes we need to do that. But like you said, Bob, we're, we're leaving a tool in the toolbox when we do that. I heard of this cool example after writing the book and talking to somebody about it from uh, British Columbia to deal with this like kind of policy creep. They made it so that when people brought a thing that they wanted to add, a new policy, they also had to come with two existing policies that were on the books that they shot, thought should be taken away. And it was really effective at like kind of turning that trend around. And also from the way the story was told to me anyway, they don't even have the requirement anymore because it kind of shifted the mindset to like, oh, well, you know, one of the things that policymakers should be doing is thinking about things that that we can take away. It reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you remember the, uh, the Kevin Klein movie, Dave, where the imposter becomes president. No, <laughs> one, of, one of the things, there's a really funny scene where there's a budget meeting and he wants to do something and they're like, you can't do it. You can't. And also he just looks at the budget and he's like, <laughs> like scratching Done. things out. Yeah. We, what do we need this for? But it, it does, it brings up another sort of uh, maybe conundrum with this. And I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, and hopefully I, I categorize it correctly, but uh, Troy Campbell, I think at Duke, if he's still there, his work on solutions bias. Maybe. It's, yeah, it's essentially this sort of idea that sometimes there's a resistance to acknowledging the problem because of the perception of the solution. So for example, one of the reasons why some people may deny climate change as an issue is because that they know the solution would be to, you know, restrict carbon emissions. And Mm -hmm. so they immediately be like, I can't acknowledge the problem. And conversely, the other example I think he uses is to 
to acknowledge any fraud in, say, social services like food stamps or something like that, if you acknowledge that that was a problem, you would open up the reality that someone would cut, you know, um, funding for that. Yeah. And I just wonder if, you know, I know I'm just sort of throwing that at you. I'm wondering if like, if, if people are thinking two steps ahead before looking at sort of less as an option or subtracting thinking, you know, and maybe this goes to loss aversion, whereas I I don't want to see that as a solution because I don't, I don't want to, you know, admit that I've, there's a problem of too much because I know that the solution will be to, to simply cut and Mm -hmm. cutting something, you know, is not something I want to do. The negative thing here, the thing that has a, you know, that we resist is this act of taking away. And I feel like a lot of these cases, when you get to the taken away situation, like once the freeway was removed from the San Francisco waterfront, everybody was happy with it pretty quickly on a time scale shifted to thinking like, oh, this is, this is better. Um, but it was, the resistance was to the like actual acts. So I wonder if it's even where, um, it sounds like that, uh, the bias from the guy at Duke is that you're, you're kind of like anticipating what's going to happen. If you let this single thing happen, I think the, it's kind of the, if you do this single action, I think it's kind of the opposite here where it's like, we we're on, we're not, fully anticipating what the benefits could be with, and we're just resisting the single action because that single action is, you know, less appealing than the additive single action. Like I'm not, I'm not a clothes horse at all. I don't have a lot of clothes, but I, you know, I've got my dresser. It's not that large, but I got to the point where like, it was just stuffed, like closing the dresser drawers was a pain. And I was like, I should really get rid of stuff. And I had read someone who basically, it was like a hundred piece wardrobe, which means like total, you know, and each sock was like one thing. So not even a pair of socks, like you only need a hundred. So I didn't get down to that, but I was like, I'm going to try to look into this and just get rid of things. And as I'm going through, I'm like, oh, but this is a shirt my wife gave me. Or, oh, this is like my old, you know, jersey, you know. And I was like, you know, so resistant to lose. But since it was happened, it's like, again, the, I did not anticipate how lovely it is to actually be able to open and close your drawers freely and find things when you need them, you know? Yeah, well, and like Marie Kondo, since we're talking about getting rid of stuff, she does a really nice job. Uh, she's the tidying guru, but um, of helping people envision the destination. So if you like read her stuff, which I did after people kept saying like, oh, your research reminds me of Marie Kondo. She's ruthlessly focused on, you know, this end destination of a decluttered closet. So it keeps you focused on this positive at the end versus the these kind of like individually potentially painful decisions where you're like, oh, this, this shirt my wife gave me. I mean, that is a hard emotional thing to, to part with. So she kind of steers us past that loss aversion in this case to the, to the end. She says like, get rid of anything that doesn't bring you joy. Right. I was thinking about that, that sentiment recently in the context of just the state of our political discourse. Mm -hmm. You know, I took a hiatus from watching and reading political stuff after the election. I was just like, it felt toxic to me. And now I still have friends who on both sides of the aisle who are immersed in it. I want to say to them, like, what what joy does it bring you to Mm -hmm. watch something that's just going to rile you up? And again, maybe that would be a good example of of uh, subtraction being an important and powerful thing to uh, to lead to some some incremental happiness. And I would argue in that case, I mean, it's not bringing joy and it's not doing anything productive for what, you know, what they're hoping to do. Right. It's like by paying attention to that, you're not actually being able to change the system in whatever direction you want to try to change the system. in. you're just getting your, you're just (laughs) making yourself miserable. It's yeah. I've been like you, I've been since the election, uh, very happy to not have to pay as much attention to what's going on. And that's not just to say that's not, um, two people who teach saying not be informed, (laughs) but it's, but it's, but it's, it's, it's actually saying that like, you know, there's different places to get information. And if the information you're getting is only making you angry, then maybe it's a different, a different option out there. Well, and there's a limit to how we can be informed, right? And so if you're yeah. spending 10 hours a week on political stuff, you're, that's 10 hours a week you might not be spending on being active in your community, right? And so if, like, if the goal here of being involved in understanding national politics and these high-level debates is to actually try to make something better, however you're defining better, like I'm not sure that's the best 
bang for your buck in terms of how you're spending your time. So yeah, I, yeah, totally agree. This is not, don't be informed. It's, um, think about how you're using your time. I listened to the podcast that you sent over with the interview and on Freakonomics, right? Mm -hmm. I was taken aback a little bit by his very honest early assessment of <laughs> first impressions of your book, right? Yeah. But, but, but I also, I, I, I understood where they're coming from, which is like, on one hand, it's like so intuitive, right? Yeah. That people can sort of simplify the premise, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming what, what, what you're saying and what you mentioned earlier is like, you know, look, you're not against addition, you know, but that subtraction is something we don't, you know, we don't go to enough or we don't consider. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, first talk about, I'm sure post book, hopefully, and conversations you've had, like you're seeing more examples of this out in the world or people are coming to you like in various professions, whether it's in the medical field or it's in, you know, engineering or related to, you know, issues of sustainability. But I'm wondering, it seems like it's one of those ideas that once you really buy in, like you just see the world differently, you know, yeah. and you come to situations differently. I wonder if you just sort of talk about some of maybe the surprising or interesting or cool examples that have, have floated up since, uh, since you've, you've dug into this. It's been amazing to have those conversations about people talking about this from all different areas. Um, I, I like the ones where it's kind of, uh, there's this business thing, uh, I guess, where you do start, stop, continue which is it's an activity that you might do mm -hmm. in like a organizational meeting or something. What are the things we're going to start? What are the things we're going to stop? What are the things we're going to continue? And it's funny because that's like the, <laughs> that matches exactly with the order in which like our, our brains work here, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, we think of adding first and it's arguably wrong. It should be stop first, right? Because it's like, why would you think about the things you're going to start before kind of creating a blank slate or like getting rid of the the clutter that's one uh, the, the policy one i thought was i guess the ones that i'm i'm gravitate more towards are the ones where there's like somebody's actually figured out a a solution uh to this to, to overcome the fact that we're not actually going to think about subtracting so that policy ingenious idea of like okay just bring two subtractions to the table mm -hmm. and what what's cool about that Yes, it, it solves the basic problem of this creep, but it also works with this fundamental thought process, which is we're not thinking about it. And if you just require people to, to think about it, then they can still decide it's policy neutral. They can decide whatever the policies are they want to get rid of, but it's at least bringing these options to the table. I'm envisioning sort of negotiation too, right? Which sometimes negotiation is if you get that, then I'll get this. Right. Versus you could also have a negotiation, which is, all right, I'll get I'll get rid of this if you get rid of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Which I don't think is probably and that's why you get these bills that are like, you know, hundreds of pages of long. That's super interesting. That's a that's a good one. Now, if somebody asked me that same question you just asked me, I will now include your negotiation example <laughs> because it, I mean, that one is. Yeah, I can't think of a time when I would like negotiating for. Yes, I'll get rid of this if you get rid of that. It also um, reminds me of, uh, I'm sure you've heard, it's, I think it's been attributed to Michelangelo and to Picasso, you know, the, the block of marble yeah, story. Yeah. I just revealed, I just saw David in the stone and chipped away until he was there. Is that? Yeah, yeah right, yeah. right. Yeah, let's get rid of things. And instead of like now, what we would do is we would add like five more blocks of marble, <laughs> <laughs> right. make it 200 feet tall, you know, yeah. which is crazy. You know, I, I was also wondering, so we're just talking sort of professionally a little bit, but personally, you know, when you started into this work, have you now, have you seen this play out in your own life? You know, I had this joke, this is sort of a joke if you went to our house now, but when I was, when I was, when we first had children, we were like, you know what, just to make sure that like, you know, uh, they can really enjoy it and they don't become sort of too materialistic. Our children will only ever have five toys in the house at any one time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, no, it never happened. Never I mean, happened. Okay. Maybe it happened with the first child for like a bit. Then all of a sudden, how do you control the grandparents' gifts and how do you do this? And yeah. so it's always sort of a struggle in your own life. So I, I know, for example, you know, sometimes I write about things and you're you're writing about them in terms of like an ideal. Like this is what I this is what I'm trying to do. But I know that I'm always not perfect about it. Like, you know, right, and I'm right, wondering right. in your situation, are there times where you're like, yeah, I completely forgot to think about subtracting or whether you now are sort of going about your your day where, again, 
the answer isn't always to subtract. You know, it's like at least I thought about it and I still did choose to buy a new shirt or to, you know, get a new this or to, you know, add something. But it is like, uh, you know, at least considering. So I'm wondering if you have, you know, been pretty good about it or whether you've some, you know, whether you have slipped and been like, ah, oh, I didn't even think about getting rid of something. I've been pretty minimalistic materially, um, comparatively compared to other Americans, <laughs> but, uh, is the busyness one. Um, I mean, I just had this, you know, type a want to show people that I'm doing a good job by doing a lot of stuff and mm. not really spending a whole lot of time thinking about which stuff is the most important and what I'm missing out on if I, you know, do this task that's kind of marginally beneficial. So I, I've gotten really ruthless, I think, with kind of how I evaluate how I'm spending my time. And I think that's one area where I still need the reminders. It still is my first instinct to think, okay, what can I do? Like, what's my to-do list? But um, like, I'll force myself to also think of stop doings when I'm making my to-do list. And that kind of helps me remember to at least consider subtracting. So that's on the the busyness. I would, and then I'm like constantly working. I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. I mean, you mentioned the kind of information diet from the political stuff, or at least the national level political stuff, just how to filter that. Uh, one thing that I've been doing, and um, this is one of those things that is like who knows if it's actually working because, um, is just taking less notes. Um, and mm. I, so the idea being that if it's important, I'm going to remember it. You know, if I have a conversation <laughs> with, um, with somebody, I, I don't need to write down the whole conversation. I'm going to remember the important bits of the conversation. And there is some like kind of scientific evidence that suggests that is helpful in some ways, but, um, but really thinking about the information that you allow into your, into your mind. Um, and that kind of overlaps a little bit with, with meditation and, and, and things like that, where you're thinking about like, okay, how am I even using my time to, to deal with this information? You know, how might, how much time am I devoting to reading stuff or, or listening to podcasts or, uh, having conversations versus how much time am I kind of playing with these ideas in my head, either on writing or in thinking about them versus how much time am I like trying to shut off, whether it's like jogging or meditating right. or something like that. And, uh, that's, you know, that's hard. I, I don't know. Two things I did a while ago that have been very helpful. And then the third thing I heard, I think again, it was in that interview where someone mentioned, which I think I want to try was I stopped taking notes a long time ago, you know? Oh really? Um, <laughs> cool. yeah, 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 yeah. And even like, if you saw what I have here for, for our conversation, it's like, you know, eight words. Mm -hmm. I don't like to take notes. Well, there's sort of like a to-do list that's, you know, a file on the Google Doc, right? That's sort of just a reminder of all the things. I know that when I go and look at it, I often get overwhelmed. And so instead it's like each day I'm like, what are the three things that I need to do today to make it a good day? Mm -hmm. And I know that the days in which I do that exercise are always better days, you know, because I'm focusing on them and I feel better about knowing that I've knocked those things off. I did see, again, the example I heard um, in one of your interviews was someone who, like, you know, we all have, you know, too many meetings, you know, people who work in certain work settings. And uh, when they get rid of the meetings, they actually keep the calendar hold on as a thank you message to themselves. Like, hey, good job. You've, you've freed this time up, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was great. Well, that's this fundamental disadvantage that subtracting has, right? It's like we you don't notice it after you do it. What your your change becomes invisible. And so there's not this reminder of, hey, here's this action that you took that that made life better for you or for somebody else. And yeah, so Sophie, who's the professor who does that, she leaves that on there as a reminder to herself, which uh, yeah, I think is a is a great uh practical way of, you know, reminding yourself of the subtraction and also like because you you're then reminded of the subtraction that was beneficial in that case you're probably more likely to use it going forward it, you know it's interesting because the other the other calendar sort of application i think about is i know that there were people who were re recommending if you want to make sure you work out then like put a calendar appointment in to work out if you want to make sure that you meditate you know put a calendar appointment in and so to me the worst thing I can see is a calendar that's full. <laughs> you know, I like to see big blocks of empty time, right? Right. And so, again, even in that, the idea of like adding, you know, a, you know, an appointment for yourself, 
right. can have the adverse opinion, you know, versus just sort of like, if you have fewer things, then presumably you're going to, you know, make the time to go work out because you're going to you feel the less pressure, right? Yeah, that's interesting. And that that's such a classic example, right? It's like, oh, I now I need to add meditating to my busy <laughs> schedule, right? It's like, you got to take something out too. Yeah. One, one of the things I wanted to get at, because I know that, I mean, I just, I, as hopefully you can tell from the conversation, I just find it fascinating, right? Because it is something we don't think about. And you see, you know, again, a lot of applications to your personal life, but as your book points out, and we've touched upon in the conversation, you see this really having a profound impact in, on policy or design and other sorts of fields. I also wanted to make sure that people don't misinterpret one of the premises of the book, right? Which is obviously if you don't have a lot, you know, whether it's money or clothes or food or choices that, you know, subtraction may not be sort of that kind of thing. So I guess the way to frame that as a question is, have you gotten any pushback from the premise in terms of, well, this sounds like a nice book for rich people with a lot of privilege who have a lot of things who just need to sort of declutter or get rid of because they've been excessive? Yeah. I mean, no valid pushback, I don't think, because <laughs> because it's, <laughs> I mean, again, like you said, the premise is that this is another option for making things better and more things to consider is bene- is just as benefit. And I would probably think more beneficial for people who have less than it is for people who have too much. So I get it that, you know, some people might kind of categorize this book in that like, oh, you know, let's streamline our lives rich people who are, who have too much stuff. And yeah, that is one application of subtracting, but I think this is much more basic. And I mean, the, one of the studies that I talk about in the book, um, this is uh, Liz Dunn and Ashley Willens. It's a, I mean, it's a pretty famous study about money and happiness. And what they basically showed was that spending money to save time was um, made people happier than spending that same amount of money on a thing. And, you know, it's subject to this criticism that you just brought up, Bob, which is that like, oh, well, yeah, that's all well and good. If you're, you have enough, that's because people who have money to spend on saving time are rich and they're, they're happier because of that. But what they found was that this was the case with people living on minimum wage too. Right. Mm. And so if they said, okay, you know, I'm gonna spend this money on getting somebody to do the dishes or I'm getting a babysitter that, you know, tended to make them happier than spending it on buying some material thing. And what, how this ties back into subtraction is what you're asking. We've, we've been talking about how hard it is to subtract from our, our to do's, right when it's free, (laughs) it's Mm. not, you know, it's hard to get rid of these things that we're already doing, even when it's free. And now, now we're asking people to spend money to do that. But that is a way that that can make people happier and not just super rich people. I mean, the other cognitive load thing is, you know, that's where Sendel's work, the most profound takeaways from that book scarcity, which, you know, they, they show that poor people make worse decisions than than rich people. And it's like, oh, that's great. You know, that that proves everything that the anti-poor people have been saying all along. But the 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 correlation is in the opposite or the causation is in the opposite direction that people mostly think, right? It's not that they're making that making bad decisions has made them poor. It's that being poor leads to bad decisions because you're you're stressed with all these other things that you have to think about, right? So if you're thinking about all the, you know, how you're gonna um put dinner on the table that night, you don't have as much time to sit down and think strategically about where you're going to fit meditating into your schedule. Right. And so I think in terms of relieving this cognitive load, that's something that could help across all economic classes. I'd never heard the phrase anti-poor people before though. (laughs) I didn't know how to say that. It's like, (laughs) but I I don't know like how to say it nicely about like what that group of people is who think that, you know, poor being poor is the poor person's fault. Um, and I think, you know, uh, thanks in part to Sendel's work, uh, that kind of perception has shifted and people are like appreciating much more that that's in fact a, a systematic issue, not a individual issue it's it's unfortunate because it is one of those things going back to the name of the show attribution where you know people do they sort of attribute someone's life outcomes to being primarily of their own agency right and not other sort of environmental sort of factors that may uh that may make uh you know certain choices or certain opportunities more difficult or less available as someone who has 
been on teams, who has had a lot of different experiences, who is interdisciplinary by the nature of your thinking. So you're pulling off a lot of different sort of fields and stuff. I, I, I always want to pause and give people the opportunity, to, you know, to say, to give credit, you know, to others. So you've had this book, obviously there's people who were probably helped and, and whatnot. I'm just wondering if you wanted to take a few minutes and, and give a shout out to anyone to uh, say, uh, you know, thanks for helping you, you know, get to uh, to where you are today. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people mentioned in the book and the acknowledgements and, uh, and then like Gabe, Ben and Andy, who were the collaborators on the research, which make up chapter one of the book. So, I mean, there's, 25 people without whom the the book wouldn't exist. But in terms of giving someone a shout out, I would think uh, Mrs. Stokey, who's my English teacher. And I think I was trying to figure out what grade it was. I think it was like ninth or 10th grade. But one of those grades were just like, I was an idiot. All my friends were idiots, you know, like we're adolescent, you know, hormones going through us uh, just, you know, and she's stuck teaching us like, Beowulf and Canterbury <laughs> Tales, right? And has to try to get these guys who only care about soccer interested in English and uh, and also like try to make us productive citizens. And and yet she did, right? And she like, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a number of people from my class who I know like have made writing a core part of their life because she was able to do that. And just to think that, you know, I grade papers now. It's not super fun to look at people's writing. I mean, yeah, that's fun to see a little bit of growth now and then, but mostly that's really painful work. And to think that she did that for her whole career, you know, in a very selfless way. I know I send her my books and she's like, you know, I, she reads them because I wrote them, but she's like most of, she only reads literature normally. <laughs> and so she's like, and so, you know, she's reading literature or, you know, eighth graders or ninth graders articles. And so just like, I've had a lot of great teachers and and collaborators like that, but Mrs. Stokey is like, you know, kind of one that stands out and is also an example of all these kind of selfless people who devote their lives to to helping other people be better at something. And, you know, she just thought of really creative ways to do it, right? I mean, she she would go to our soccer games uh, and, you know, that was just as important as getting us to buy into to writing as, you know, kind of the comments that she was providing on our papers. So, um, yeah, Mrs. Stokey would be one that I would mention. That's awesome. The two things that sort of strike me there is that uh, one, that even as grownups, we refer to our teachers, you know, with the, the <laughs> yeah, formal sort of misses, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, which is cool. And, uh, and the fact that you send her your books is awesome too. I mean, I'm always a big fan of like, sometimes there are people who are instrumental in our lives or we forget about them, or even if we remember them, we don't let them know. And so, you know, the opportunity to that is, uh, is awesome. So, uh, and by the way, one of those things, which I, uh, I think that, uh, maybe more is always the answer. <laughs> you can't be, you can't, no, no, don't, don't take this to sort of as a, as a permission to be less, to subtract gratefulness from your, uh, from your daily lives. No, it's add and subtract, right? <laughs> Adding right. Is, is very often the right answer. So. That's right. Well, Lady, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to connect. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. This was great. I appreciate the thoughtful questions and the you know, the eight words that you wrote down. You, you definitely had a deep understanding of the material. Thank you for listening to Attribution. The show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know.